Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Firewalls Don't Stop Dragons. I'm your host, Kerry Parker. Today we have episode 397 for October 7th, 2024. Getting very close to the big 400 milestone. Just three more episodes to go. And uh, I have actually just finished recording my interview with Bruce Schneier, uh, who has graciously agreed to come back for every 100th episode. It took me a long time to get him to come on the show, and I finally convinced him to come on the 100th uh, episode as a big, you know, as a big milestone. And I think it was even him that said, you know, hey, I'll see you for 200. And of course, I've helped him to that ever since. <laughs> He probably, he probably did not assume this uh, this podcast would last that long. Most podcasts, I don't think, do last this long. But anyway, there we are. So uh, he's back for his fourth centennial episode, and it was fun as always. Bruce is always a great interview, and uh, we had a good time. So that one that one is recorded. It has not yet been edited, but it will be dropping. Uh, I think the last week of October, just three weeks from now. So happy Cybersecurity Awareness Month. That is always October. I used to participate in the uh, National Cybersecurity Alliance uh, Cybersecurity Champion thing for the month of October. But it, I mean, honestly, I <laughs> every month for me basically is Cybersecurity Month. So uh, I'm, I'm probably not going to officially do that this year. But I would just like to point out that CISA, the American um, Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, uh, has some really great resources. Of course, staysafeonline.org does as well. So if you're looking for materials either to help teach other people or for yourself, uh, these are great places to look. I will put links, of course, in the show notes. If you have not updated your iOS devices or your macOS devices, they both had some really big releases in September as usual, iOS 18 and macOS Sequoia, which I think is version 15. If you have not already updated those, now would be a good time. I usually wait for the first uh, incremental release uh, for those like iOS 18.0.1 and macOS Sequoia 15.0.1. Those are now out. Those usually fix all the, the bug fixes that were there at the very beginning. So now would be a good time to do that. And if you're already on the, the base versions of those, definitely upgrade because those point releases have some security fixes as well. I just updated all my devices uh, yesterday and the day before. So far, everything's been fine. The iPhone mirroring on macOS is a very cool feature. And there's some other great privacy features too, which we covered in an earlier show. Uh, I've also just updated my phone. I got an iPhone 16 Pro. The Apple iPhone updates from release to release are getting pretty minimal, but I've been on the old one for like three years now and I was ready for an upgrade. Plus I really wanted to make sure that I had the, the newest version of the phone so I could take full advantage of Apple's upcoming Apple intelligence stuff which will be rolling out slowly over the next year. Too slow, too slowly for me, but you know, hey, I'd rather them get it right than rush it out. So anyway, I'm looking forward to that. Stay tuned after the news. I've got some updates, some important notes for patrons and uh, prospective patrons. I don't talk about that enough, but I do a little catching up uh, today. So we'll talk about that after the news, but today we have a new show. Um, so here's kind of the rundown of what we're gonna talk about today. Um, the California governor, Gavin Newsom, vetoed a bill requiring opt-out signals, which really did not please me. Uh, we'll talk about that and his reasoning for it, but I'm not buying it. Also, as I've warned you many times, uh, stay away from DNA services, like the ones that help you trace your ancestry and things like that. And I've warned about this exact outcome before, and that is 23andMe is not doing well as a business. It, is, it has been delisted, I think, from the stock exchange and is looking like it's going to go out of business. And so it is probably looking to sell off its assets and its most valuable assets is your DNA. So it's not really clear how that's going to go, but uh, now would be a great time to remove your data. We'll talk about that. PayPal has opted you into sharing your data without your knowledge or consent. <laughs> this is, could be a, another lawsuit, but this is, gosh, this is happening left and right. So I'll tell you about yet another instance of where the terms of service have changed from underneath you. Kaspersky has deleted itself from all American computers and uh, automatically replaced itself with a different product without asking for permission. There's been another major leak from a data broker affecting 100 million Americans. Somebody figured out how to put facial recognition technology into Meta's smart glasses, allowing it to basically walk around, take pictures of people's faces and instantly identify people on the go. But we do have some good news as well. NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, has finally updated its uh, password guidelines. 
uh, password rules and uh, they've gotten rid of some of the sillier things that we've been complaining about for a long time, but now it's official. Governor Newsom in California did sign a new California law that uh, adds to data privacy for cars to help protect domestic abuse survivors. And the U.S. and Microsoft have seized over 100 websites related to Russian hackers. And then finally, we'll end up with my tip of the week. And that will be about figuring out whether or not one of your accounts has been compromised. So lots to talk about. Let's get to it. All right, first up, this is from Ars Technica. Uh, and it's about, I talked to you about this bill a while ago, and I was kind of excited about it. California uh, passed this bill that would force you know, operating system makers to include an opt-out signal uh, globally so that people could just set it once and forget it, and uh, Governor Newsom vetoed it. Uh, let's read the details. California Governor Gavin Newsom vetoed a bill that would have required makers of web browsers and mobile operating systems to let consumers send opt-out preference signals that could limit businesses' use of personal information. The bill approved by the state legislature last month would have required an opt-out signal, quote, that communicates the consumer's choice to opt out of the sale and sharing of the consumer's personal information or to limit the use of the consumer's sensitive personal inf information, unquote. It would have made it illegal for a business to offer a web browser or mobile operating system without a setting that lets consumers, quote, send an opt-out preference signal to businesses with which the consumer interacts, unquote. In a veto message sent to the legislature Friday, Newsom said he would not sign the bill. Newsom wrote that he shares the desire to enhance consumer privacy, noting that he previously signed a bill requiring the California Privacy Protection Agency to establish an accessible deletion mechanism allowing consumers to request that data brokers delete all of their personal information. But Newsom said he is opposed to the new bill's mandate on operating systems. And this is a quote from Gavin Newsom, quote, I am concerned, however, about placing a mandate on operating system developers at this time. No major mobile OS incorporates an option for an opt-out signal. By contrast, most internet browsers either include such an option or, if the users choose, they can download a plugin with the same functionality. To ensure the ongoing usability of mobile devices, it's best if design questions are first addressed by developers rather than by regulators. For this reason, I cannot sign the bill." Unquote. Vetoes can be overridden with a two-thirds vote in each chamber. The bill was approved 59 to 12 in the Assembly and 31 to 7 in the Senate, which, by the way, if you do the math, would be enough to override the veto. But the article goes on to say, the state legislature hasn't overridden a veto in decades. The opt-out bill would have built on the California Consumer Privacy Act, or CCPA, of 2018, and the California Privacy Rights Act, or CPRA, of 2020. Google, which recently nixed a plan to turn off tracking cookies by default in Chrome, urged Newsom to veto the bill, reports by Bloomberg and Politico said. And this is a quote from Justin Klotzko, who's a tech and privacy advocate for Consumer Watchdog. Justin says, quote, It's troubling the power that companies such as Google appear to have over the governor's office. What the governor didn't mention is that Google Chrome... Apple Safari and Microsoft Edge don't offer a global opt-out, and they make up nearly 90% of the browser market share. That's what matters. And people don't want to install plugins. Safari, which is the default browser on iPhones, doesn't even accept a plugin, unquote. Consumer Reports policy analyst Matt Schwartz said that, quote, industry worked overtime to squash this bill as it empowered the Californians to better protect their privacy, undermining the commercial surveillance business model of these tech companies. We strongly disagree with the idea expressed in the governor's veto statement that it should be left to operating systems to provide privacy choices for consumers. They've shown time and again that they won't meaningfully do so until forced, unquote. Consumer Reports is one of the groups behind Global Privacy Control, or GPC, an opt-out signal that creators hope will become legally binding under the CCPA or other privacy laws. Makers of global privacy control say it is superior to the older do not track signal because the California Attorney General, quote, determined that the AG could not require businesses to comply with do not track requests because the requests do not clearly convey users intent to opt out of the sale of their data, unquote. And I'll come back to that a little bit later. And this is a continuation of the quote. The California AG has determined that businesses must honor two methods of submitting opt-outs. GPC is meant to provide users with an additional option for objecting to the sale of their data, and it functions identically to clicking Do Not Sell My Personal Information link provided by a business, unquote. Global privacy control is available on Firefox, Brave, DuckDuckGo, and several other browsers, but not Google's Chrome, Microsoft's Edge, and Apple's Safari. And again, those make up 90% of the browser market. 
So back really quick to that DNT thing. I talked about this recently. Do not track was something that started a long time ago, uh, had a lot of promise, I think. And uh, some of the browser makers, Microsoft at the time, which was seems like an odd choice back then, but it's, it was a while back, turned it on by default, which caused a lot of web retailers to immediately say, oh, no, 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 the, uh, we're not going to honor that because the user didn't choose that. Microsoft chose that. And I think that's what they're referring to here. But this seems to suffer from the same thing, uh, unless, of course, no browsers turn it on by default, in which case now it would definitely be an affirmative action by a user to send this signal. So global privacy control. I've talked about this for a lot. It's been around a long time, not quite as long as DNT, but I wrote a whole article on how to enable this that you should check out. You, could, uh, you can find it on my website. Just search for GPC or global privacy control. Not only will it tell you how to do it, it will tell you how to verify that it is working properly. There is a link to that article in the show notes. But to sum up, I definitely agree with you know most of the quoted privacy advocates here. This is a silly reason to veto that bill. And I'm honestly very disappointed in the governor. I, I don't get it. I, it really does look like backroom dealing where you got pressure from people who probably give him a lot of money. Uh, so uh, you know that's another big issue with the politics here in America. We've got to get money out of the political process because it just taints everything. So we'll see if the California uh, legislature actually tries to override this veto. Sounds like that's not a likely thing to occur, but uh, if it does happen, I will let you know. Because as is often the case in California, even if it's only a California law, a lot of companies will honor that outside of California as well, just because it's difficult not to. So I hope this passes still somehow, or maybe gets folded into a future bill in a slightly different way in such, in such a way that the governor would sign it. I will keep you posted on this. All right, next up, this is from Teach Privacy, an article from Daniel Solov. And it is about 23andMe basically going out of business and what that means for your DNA. And even if you haven't used 23andMe, if you've used another DNA service, you need to pay attention to this. A recent article in The Atlantic discusses the risk of 23andMe selling its vast stockpile of DNA data on 15 million individuals. And this is a quote from that article. 23andMe is not doing well. Its stock is on the verge of being delisted. In other words, taken off the stock exchange. It shut down its in-house drug development unit last month, only the latest in several rounds of layoffs. Last week, the entire board of directors quit, save for Ann Wojcicki, a co-founder and the company's CEO. Amid this downward spiral, the CEO has said she'll consider selling 23andMe, which means the DNA of 23andMe's 15 million customers would be up for sale too. All right, back to Daniel's article. Can anything be done to protect this DNA data in the event of a sale? More than two decades ago, the FTC intervened in a bankruptcy sale of personal data by ToySmart, an online toy merchant that had massive quantities of children's data. The FTC limited ToySmart's ability to sell its data only to companies operating in a similar market and agreeing to abide by the same privacy policies as ToySmart had in place. But the ToySmart case was a deception case under the FTC Act, triggered by the fact that the company had stated in its privacy notice that it would not share the personal data of its customers to third parties. The lessons company learned from ToySmart is to include the sale of data as an asset in a potential bankruptcy. This makes the deception case difficult or impossible to bring. 23andMe has done this, writing the following in its privacy notice. And this is a quote. If we are involved in a bankruptcy, merger, acquisition, reorganization, or sale of assets, your personal information may be accessed, sold, or transferred as part of that transaction, and this privacy statement will apply to your personal information as transferred to the new entity. The failure of the notice and choice approach is about as established as the law of gravity. Nobody reads privacy notices. Meaningful consent can't be inferred from customer inaction. The existence of a notice alone provides no indication of consumer consent whatsoever. Ultimately, consumers need protection here. Many consumers didn't contemplate that their DNA data would be sold off to other companies for whatever potential uses they may want. Although the buyer would be subject to the terms of 23andMe's privacy notice, the notice, as with most, is written in a way that is rather flexible. The notice is written with the typical statement that it may be changed at any time. Here's a list of allowable uses for the privacy notice, and I'm not going to read all of them, uh, but the first one is the allow of allowable uses is to 
Provide our services, including to develop, operate, improve, maintain, and safeguard our services, including developing new product tools and features. And there's a whole bunch of others, but I think that's the key one. Uh, and the article goes on. It's unclear whether a new buyer that offers somewhat different services would be bound by the specific services 23andMe offers or how broadly or narrowly services will be interpreted. There are a myriad of ways that the data can be used as privacy notices are drafted to provide a lot of wiggle room so that companies can use data. In the event of a sale of the DNA data, the FTC could bring an unfairness action under the FTC Act. A potential basis for this would be the Sears case. There, Sears installed spyware onto users' computers, but it disclosed it in the privacy notice. The FTC concluded that given the significant privacy invasiveness of spyware, burying this fact in the privacy notice was not sufficient and was an unfair practice. Given the nature of DNA data, the FTC might be able to reach a similar, similar conclusion and move beyond the mere disclosure of a sale of the data in the privacy notice. This would be a bold move for the FTC, but an important one. If privacy protection is to have any real teeth, then it would seem to me that there should be significant restrictions and safeguards on the sale of this data. So yeah, this is something that I've been warning about for a long time. <laughs> There's even some of these companies that try to reuse this DNA information, our DNA information for medical purposes, and they say that they anonymize it. You can't anonymize DNA data. Your DNA is you, like it's literally you. There's no way you can anonymize that data. Yeah, you could take the name off of it, but re-identifying someone based on their DNA is, I mean, it's a forensic tool used by law enforcement. So there is no way to anonymously use someone's DNA. So I would certainly recommend if you have used 23andMe in the past or given this to somebody as a gift or just know somebody else who has done this, go and ask them to delete your data right away. Who knows how much longer they're going to be around as a going concern. Who knows when they might try to sell this data and when those contracts might be written that would allow them to give away this data. It's apparently easy to do if you've got a 23andMe account, you go to your settings, go to 23andMe data and select delete your data. And honestly, I would do this with any other DNA service you've used, ancestry.com or whatever else. The way most of these things work is you send them the thing, they give you a report and that's kind of it. Like there's no real reason for them to hold on to your data at that point. Well, not for you anyway. So I would do this for any other DNA service you've used, ask them to delete your data. And if you want, maybe request a copy of your data first, because it might be interesting to see what they have on you, like everything, and then ask them to delete it. All right, next up, this is from 404 Media. And <laughs> it's just, man, the hits just keep coming. We've had an article like this almost every new show for the last few new shows, I think. And this one, this one's about PayPal, and they have decided that they're going to share your data, and they didn't really give you the choice. PayPal quietly opted users into sharing data with third parties, quote, for personalized shopping experiences, unquote, according to multiple complaints on social media and 404 Media's own tests. And by the way, uh, I tested this too, and they had opted me in as well without telling me. And this is a quote from PayPal, quote, starting early summer 2025, we'll be building more personal experiences for you. You can opt in and out of sharing at any time by adjusting this setting, unquote. On Monday, before I contacted PayPal for comment, the page also included a line that said, quote, we'll use info collected about you after November 27th, 2024 to personalize your shopping, unquote. As of Tuesday, and I think that's last Tuesday, that line is no longer on the page. As noted by Twitter under Ellen Dalto, you can find that setting and change it by logging into your PayPal account and going to settings, data and privacy, manage shared info, personalized shopping, and then turn it off. Or you can click here while logged in. And obviously that's a link you can't click by listening to it. But if you go to the article, you can click on that link. And if you're already logged into um, PayPal, uh, it'll take you right to this setting. As of writing, PayPal opts users into sharing their data by default without their knowledge, unless they navigate to the personalized shopping settings on their own. On that page, a toggle is set to sharing on, agreeing to the statement, quote, let us share products, offers, and rewards you might like with participating stores, unquote. 404 Media tested the process with two PayPal accounts, including a historical one and one created over the last few days. In both cases, the accounts were opted in by default. There's also a link to a new version of PayPal's privacy statement, which differs from, and has a different URL than, the privacy statement you would navigate to from anywhere else on the site. The new statement's URL ends with privacy preview full effective November 
27, 2024. The new statement provides several sections relevant to the personalized shopping feature, including, and this is a quote, personal information we disclose includes, for example, products, sizes, preferences, and styles we think you'll like. Unless we are required by law to obtain your consent, we disclose personal information collected after November 27th, 2024, or from earlier, if you consent, for personalized shopping experiences. To opt out of disclosures or personal information to partners and merchants for personalized shopping experiences, log into your PayPal account and edit your preferences in the data and privacy setting. If you opt out, we will continue to disclose your personal information as necessary to complete transactions you initiate, but will not disclose personal information to partners and merchants for personalized shopping experiences. The new privacy statement also says personal information sent to partners and merchants or their service providers are, quote, subject to the partners and merchants' own privacy policies and procedures, unquote, and that PayPal is, again, quote, not responsible for privacy or security practices of partners and merchants, unquote. I asked PayPal whether customers will be directly notified before November 27th that the company plans to share their data with third parties, uh, partners and merchants, and what happens to the user's data if they opt out after that date. PayPal did not respond. So I don't get, I still don't understand how this is legal. I, I mean, when you sign up for a service, you agree to the terms and conditions at that time. But all these terms and conditions say, well, we can change them at any time. They probably say without notice, though a lot of times you do get a very generic email saying, hey, we've updated our terms of service or privacy policy, click here for more info. And of course, it just links to the whole privacy policy and you've got to figure out what changed. Sometimes they try to you know, highlight what has changed, but it's all these euphemisms and dark patterns and things that obfuscate what they're really doing and what their impacts to you might be. So it's, again, this whole notice and consent thing is just a joke. But I, I mean, just from a legal standpoint, I mean, what contract have you ever really signed uh, that says we could change this at any time as long as we let you know that we're changing it. I mean, can you imagine if you you bought a house and you signed the mortgage and part of that mortgage thing says, yeah, well, you know, we could change this whenever we want. And you, you by signing this document, you agree to let us do that. I mean, okay, I'm not a lawyer, but this is just super shady and, <laughs> and we need privacy laws to protect us from this kind of crap. All right, moving on. This is from Bleeping Computer. And if you were a Kaspersky antivirus user, you have probably already seen this, but this is, this is just another horrendous screw up. And, and all right, let me just read the article starting Thursday. And this is a week or two ago, Russian cybersecurity company Kaspersky deleted its anti-malware software from customers' computers across the United States and automatically replaced it with ultra AVs antivirus solution. This comes after Kaspersky decided to shut down its U.S. operations and lay off U.S.-based employees in response to the U.S. government adding Kaspersky to the entity list, a catalog of foreign individuals, companies, and organizations deemed a national security concern in June. On June 20th, the Biden administration also announced a ban on sales and software updates for Kaspersky antivirus software in the United States starting September 29th, 2024, over potential national security risks. In July, Kaspersky told Bleeping Computer that it would begin closing its business and lay off the staff on July 20th because of the sales and distribution ban. In early September, Kaspersky also emailed customers, assuring them they would continue receiving, quote, reliable cybersecurity protection, unquote, from Ultra AV, which is owned by Pango Group, which I've never heard of, after Kaspersky stopped selling software and updates for U.S. customers. However, those emails failed to inform users that Kaspersky's products would be abruptly deleted from their computers and replaced with Ultra AV without warning. According to many online customer reports, including Bleeping Computers forums, Ultra AV software was installed on their computers without any prior notification, with many concerned that their devices had been infected with malware. I mean, let me just stop, right? So what, what happens is all of a sudden their antivirus is gone and it's replaced by some other antivirus. That would raise alarm bells for me as well. And this is a quote from one of the users on one of the forums said, quote, I woke up and saw this new antivirus system on my desktop and I tried opening Kaspersky, but it was gone. So I had to look up what happened because I was literally having a mini heart attack that my desktop somehow had a virus which uninstalled Kaspersky somehow, unquote. To make things worse, while some users could uninstall Ultra AV using the software's uninstaller, those who tried removing it using uninstall apps 
saw it reinstalled after a reboot causing further concerns about a potential malware infection. Some also found Ultra VPN installed, likely because they had a Kaspersky VPN subscription. Not much is known about Ultra AV besides being part of Pango Group, which controls multiple VPN brands like Hotspot Shield, Ultra VPN, and BetterNet, and Comparatech, a VPN software review website. So again, let me stop real quick. <laughs> I talked about this before, but yes, this company owns multiple VPNs and also a VPN software review site, where if you went to right now, I'm sure that their VPNs would be featured highly there. All right, so this article was updated a little bit later. Uh, here's, here's the update to that article. A Pango Group spokesperson told Bleepy Computer after the article was published that Kaspersky, quote, began communicating this transition to U.S. customers on September 5th and that users with valid email addresses received direct communications and all users had access to transition notifications in-app on My Kaspersky account pages and via Kaspersky Labs web pages, unquote. Pango Group also shared a screenshot of an in-app Kaspersky pop-up notifying customers that their Kaspersky service will soon be moving to Ultra AV and Ultra AV protection will be automatically activated, unquote, on the device as part of this transition. It's unclear whether Kaspersky users found Ultra AV installed on their computers didn't see this notification or were confused because it didn't explain that, that Kaspersky would be uninstalled and replaced with Ultra AV. So let me just stop and and make sure we understand what happened here. So the U.S. government basically came out and said, we, we don't trust Kaspersky. And we put it on a special list that basically says nobody could do can deal with Kaspersky. So basically that killed them off in the U.S. market, and they had to wrap up things and, and go home. So Kaspersky decided that, you know, it wants to continue offering something to its customers. I, I get that. Um, and apparently it sent out some kind of vague notices saying, hey, don't worry about it. We got you covered. Uh, you know, once Kaspersky goes away, you will have access to this Ultra AV thing. But even with this last update, it was just not clear that, that what they were intending to do was on a certain date, they were going to uninstall Kaspersky and then automatically install this new product called Ultra AV. That is kind of disturbing, and I really don't think they should have done that without some sort of a pop-up saying, hey, we're about to do this, here's why, here's what's going on, click here to say yes. Now, I've heard some interesting theories about why they did this, one of which being, uh, you know, this is a valuable business, and when they approached Ultra AV, you know, they had to find somebody to take this over, when they approached Ultra AV, they basically said, hey, look, we will sell you our U.S. business and it will come automatically with all of our customers because the way we're going to do this is we're automatically going to give you every single one of our customers. No choice. They're going to automatically become your customers overnight, which also means, by the way, that I have to assume that they must have transferred all of your customer information from Kaspersky to Ultra AV, probably including your payment information so that you do, you know, God forbid, would have interrupted service when it came time to renew your your subscription. So I think this is slimy. I mean, you know, maybe it's just their way of kind of poking a finger at the U.S. for making them do this. I, I don't know. But I'm sure a lot of it, frankly, was just a financial decision. They would get a lot more money from Ultra AV if they could promise them that every single one of their customers would be coming over. And the only way to do that is just to automatically move everybody without really giving them a choice. So again, the whole notice and consent model that we lean on in this country is just a complete farce. All right, more to get to. Let's keep going. This one's from Tom's Guide, and it's about yet another massive data leak from a data broker, one that you were not an explicit customer of. You didn't choose these people, and they still had all your data, and it leaked out. Having to get a background check done is bad enough as it is, but what if all your personal and employment information was left exposed online for anyone to access? Well, that's exactly what just happened for at least 100 million Americans. Unlike with data breaches, which are usually the work of hackers, data leaks occur when a company fails to properly secure the data points it has on customers, or in this case, one third of the entire U.S. population. As reported by Cyber News, its security researchers recently discovered a worrying data leak at a company called MC2 Data, which operates a number of public record and background check sites, including privaterecords.net, private reports, people searcher, the People Searchers, and People Search USA. 
Just like with other past data leaks, this one was likely the result of a human error instead of hackers. Cyber News research team found approximately 106 million records or 2.2 terabytes of data from MC2 data was stored in a database without a password on, on August 7th. This could have allowed anyone on the internet to access and download this information, including hackers. It's estimated that at least 100 million U.S. citizens are affected by this data leak. However, the data of 2.3 million MC2 subscribers was also leaked as a result of this database being left unprotected online. The leaked data includes the names, email addresses, IP addresses, physical addresses, phone numbers, dates of birth, employment history, property records, legal records, employment history, encrypted passwords, and even data on the families, relatives, and neighbors of those affected. It appears that no financial information was leaked, though. Whew, oh, great. Normally, after a major data breach, a company will provide free access to the best identity theft protection service, or at least credit monitoring to its customers. However, as MC2 Data and other background check companies have your data, even though you aren't technically a customer, that likely won't be the case here unless a government agency intervenes. So what could hackers do with all this leaked data? Based on the types of data that were exposed online, targeted phishing attacks are the most likely outcome. In these types of attacks, hackers use the information they have on you, which is a lot here, to craft personalized phishing emails or text messages. You see, hackers could use these phishing messages as a way to coax more information like passwords or credit card details out of you. Likewise, they could send you malicious links or malware-filled attachments as a way to infect your computer or even your smartphone. With all of this personal and employment information out there, my best advice is for you to be extremely careful and diligent when checking your inbox or even your messages for the foreseeable future. Look out for messages from unknown senders that try to instill a sense of urgency. However, as phone numbers were also exposed, you could be getting scam calls too. It's one thing for hackers to break into a company and steal its data. It's another when a database filled with troves of personal information is left unsecured online without a password. Hopefully, MC2 Data and all the other companies that handle troves of sensitive data learned from this incident. However, I've written loads of stories about unsecured databases over the years, and this kind of thing just seems to keep happening. Yep, it certainly does. We talk about it on here quite a bit, and often there's not a lot of uh, repercussions for the companies that do this. Part of the problem is there's been so many data leaks that when somebody is you know, hacked based on this or as a victim of identity theft because of this, it's really hard to point to one specific data leak and say, that is the reason, that is the culprit. This is the company we should be suing. And of course, the other thing is you are not a customer of these people. You are their product. You never signed up for this. And yet they have all this data on you and <laughs> and they were not careful with this data. They, were, they did not keep it secure and you paid the price. And so far they haven't. We'll see, we'll see what comes out of this. All right, one more here from 404 Media, uh, and this is about uh, some researchers at Harvard who put facial recognition technology into Meta's smart glasses, because of course they did. So this is short, uh, and it goes like this. A pair of students at Harvard have built what big tech companies refused to release publicly due to the overwhelming risks and danger involved. Smart glasses with facial recognition technology that automatically looks up someone's face and identifies them. The students have gone a step further, too. Their customized glasses also pull other information about their subject from around the web, including their home address, phone number, and family members. The project is designed to raise awareness of what is possible with this technology, and the pair are not releasing their code, according to one of the creators. But the experiment, tested in some cases on unsuspecting people in the real world, according to a demo video, which, by the way, you can get to by going to the article, which it's worth watching, still shows the razor-thin line between a world in which people can move around with relative anonymity to one where your identity and personal information can be pulled up in an instant by strangers. The two creators call the project iXray. It uses a pair of Meta's commercially available Ray-Ban smart glasses and allows a user to just go from face to name. The demo video posted to X or Twitter on Tuesday shows the pair using the tech against various people. In one of the first examples, one of the researchers walks towards the wearer. Quote, to use it, you just put the glasses on and then you walk by people. The glasses will detect when somebody's face is in the frame. After a few seconds, their personal information pops up on your phone. Unquote. In another example, the demo shows a test on what it describes as a real person in the subway. One of the researchers looks at the results of a face match on his phone and then approaches a woman he calls Betsy. He introduces himself and claims the pair met through a particular foundation, presumably referencing something included in the search results. 
And a quote from that researcher, quote, in our video, we purposefully added reactions we got from random people on the subway in Boston, acting as if we knew them, unquote. So that's about all there is to this article. Uh, the video is interesting to watch, but basically here, here's what's going on. Meta came out with these smart glasses a long time ago, and these smart glasses have a built-in camera and they interact with your phone, uh, some app on your phone. So the, the glasses are basically, uh, I think they're Wayfarers. I think they're these looking glasses, but they've got a built-in camera and they're just constantly monitoring everything in front of you. So these guys hooked into that somehow with an app they wrote and they had facial recognition going uh, with the glasses such that whenever a face came into view, uh, a snapshot was taken of that face, and then it used currently available technology on the web right now, uh, in particular PIM eyes and fact check ID, to look up those faces. And then once it found faces in the database, it could then do other searches based on their name and, and other things to bring up their social media stuff. And basically their software did all of this in the background uh, as you're walking around and looking at people and as it found faces, it would send that info to their special app on your phone, showing you the picture of their face and then everything they found on that person. And so this, so one of the researchers used this on a subway to walk up to this lady he, he'd never met before in his life, found her name, found some information about her that she works on this foundation or whatever, and then walked up and said, oh, hey, Betsy, yeah, I, I met you at that foundation thing. Remember me? Which, you know, they'd never met each other before ever. So you, you can see that this would have a lot of problems. Clearview AI is the company that was doing this on steroids. And as far as I know, they are still doing this. Uh, we talked with Cashmere Hill about this a while back, uh, which was about her book, Your Face Belongs to Us, which is a fantastic book and a great interview. You might want to go back and check that one out. But this reminded me that I, in my recent series that I did on open source intelligence, a lot of this information out there that is publicly available about all of us and how to find it and then hopefully delete it. I didn't really cover facial recognition stuff. So I've actually updated the second article in that series with this information as well. So uh, you can go to my articles on this and find the links to PIM eyes and fact check ID, and it'll uh, give you a link to the place where you can ask for your data to be deleted from that database. All right, now I've got a few actually good stories for you. We'll start off with another one here from Ars Technica, and it's about the National Institute of Standards and Technology finally updating their password guidelines, which are actually password rules for some agencies. In other words, these are enforceable in some of the government agencies, but otherwise a lot of other companies uh, just kind of looked at these guys to set the, the, the accepted best practices. Uh, <laughs> and this is a long time coming. The, I don't think this article mentions this, but the guy who worked for NIST a long time ago, who originally came up with some of these rules, uh, has since recanted. And I've talked about this before. He, he, he basically said, I kind of made this up. I mean, he's like, yeah, maybe it's a good idea if we change our passwords every six months uh, without actually having any data behind that whatsoever. But of course it got put into the original guidelines and everybody took it as gospel and we've been dealing with it ever since. Well, they finally changed that among other things. So let me, <laughs> let me read this article from Mars Technica. The National Institute of Standards and Technology, or NIST, the federal body that sets technology standards for governmental agencies, standards organizations, and private companies, has proposed barring some of the most vexing and nonsensical password requirements. Chief among them, mandatory resets, required or restricted use of certain characters, and the use of security questions. Choosing strong passwords and storing them safely is one of the most challenging parts of a good cybersecurity regimen. More challenging still is complying with password rules imposed by employers, federal agencies, and providers of online services. Frequently, the rules, ostensibly to enhance security hygiene, actually undermine it. And yet, the nameless rule makers impose the requirements anyway. Last week, NIST released its second public draft of SP 800-63-4, the latest version of its digital identity guidelines. At roughly 35,000 words and filled with jargon and bureaucratic terms, the document is nearly impossible to read all the way through and just as hard to understand fully. It sets both the technical requirements and recommended best practices for determining the validity of methods used to authenticate digital identities online. Organizations that interact with the federal government online are required to be in compliance. A section devoted to passwords injects a large helping of badly needed common sense practices that challenge common policies. An example, the new rules bar the requirement that end users periodically change their passwords. This requirement came into being decades ago when password security was poorly understood and it was common for people to choose common names, dictionary words, and other secrets that were easily guessed. 
Since then, most services require the use of stronger passwords made up of randomly generated characters or phrases. When passwords are chosen properly, the requirement to periodically change them, typically every one to three months, can actually diminish security because the added burden incentivizes weaker passwords that are easier for people to set and remember. Another requirement that often does more harm than good is the required use of certain characters, such as at least one number, one special character, and one upper and lowercase letter. When passwords are sufficiently long and random, there's no benefit from requiring or restricting the use of certain characters. Again, rules governing composition can actually lead to people choosing weaker passcodes. Critics have for years called out the folly and harm resulting from many commonly enforced password rules. And yet, banks, online services, and government agencies have largely clung to them anyway. The new guidelines, should they become final, aren't universally binding, but they could provide persuasive talking points in favor of doing away with the nonsense. So, yeah, <laughs> what happens when you tell people to do some of these things, especially when you tell them they need to remember these things, is they pick poor passwords. And I, I did this way back in the day, too, before I understood security, when my company would say, all right, you got to change your password every three months and it's got to be different. So I'd pick like a base password and put a one at the end. And when they told me to change it, I would have the same base password with a two at the end. Everybody did that because <laughs> that was the way you remembered those passwords. And that is just not good practice. Oftentimes, when I talk about this in my class or in the book, to me, it comes down to guessability. And guessability is not the same as having at least one number, at least one character and all that kind of stuff, right? Yes, there is definitely math behind this notion of the bigger the alphabet, that is the number of possibilities for each character in your password, you want to maximize that. And if you use an upper, lower letters and special characters, that's about 95 different character possibilities. I mean, the math just shows that the, the, the wider spread that is, the more possibilities there are per character, the longer it will take to guess all possible passwords. But here's the thing. As long as the bad guys know that it's possible that you could be using any of those characters, you don't actually have to include each of those characters in every single password. If you've got a strong enough password that they're stuck with nothing else but to try every possible password to, to guess it, uh, because you didn't use your birthday, your anniversary, your dog's name, your alma mater, your grandkids' names, the you know, favorite artists or movies or whatever, if it's not something guessable, if somebody who knows you wouldn't guess it, then at that point, they're stuck with brute force methods. They've got to try every possible password. And if it's possible for you to use any of those characters, you don't necessarily have to use all those characters because they still have to assume you did. So anyway, the, the, the main point here is that NIST has finally pulled their head out of their butt and, uh, and, and changed the official document that everybody relies on as the best practices. And hopefully we'll start seeing some of this common sense filtering down to the, uh, the requirements imposed upon us by our banks and all these other places too. All right, so we talked earlier today about California not passing a privacy bill, uh, but they did actually pass another one that was really good. Uh, and this is from the record. A bill requiring connected car manufacturers to allow drivers to cut off remote access to their vehicles so they cannot be tracked by abusers was signed into law by California Governor Gavin Newsom on Friday. The measure, which received strong support in California legislature, was passed as part of a package of eight bills designed to help domestic violence survivors. The legislation reflects the increasing sophistication of internet-connected vehicles' capabilities, including the ability to track a user's whereabouts from afar. Because manufacturers typically produce car models that can be sold in a variety of markets, it is thought that the California bill could lead to a nationwide change. News reports late last year documented how abusers have used connected cars to stalk former partners, and the issue has been getting the attention of regulators. Under the new California law, automakers will have to change how the connected cars they sell work by allowing drivers who establish that they legally possess a given vehicle to request that specific people can no longer remotely access their car. The law also will ban automakers from charging a fee to drivers seeking to cut off remote access and requires manufacturers to create an easy-to-use process for submitting requests. It also requires the automakers provide in-vehicle alerts to the drivers if remote vehicle technology is being used. And this is a quote from friend of the show, Andrea Miko, founder of Privacy for Cars. And uh, Andrea says, quote, we applaud California's governor and lawmakers for passing the first law that specifically tackles abuse perpetrated through vehicle technologies. Sadly, 
much more is needed, unquote. And that is an understatement. Earlier this year, Amico's organization, along with a coalition of domestic violence advocacy groups, filed comments with the Federal Communications Commission of the FCC, calling on it to require that automakers disclose on dealership window stickers if cars allow remote access and create a hotline for survivors seeking information about how to disable it. In April, the FCC announced it is exploring how the agency can use existing law to hold automakers and wireless service providers accountable for ensuring domestic violence survivors who are drivers of connected cars cannot be harassed by abusers. The agency's formal proceeding, now underway, is examining whether FCC rules changes are needed to address the problem. So, yay, we need some more of that. Uh, Cars today are a privacy nightmare. Uh, so, you know, every little bit helps. This is a good first step. We've got a long way to go. Uh, so as it turns out, I'm actually going to be giving a joint talk with Andrea Amico in Atlanta soon. Uh, there's a conference there called Hacker Halted. It is right around uh, Halloween. In fact, our talk will be on Halloween day. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to that. I've been working with Andrea on and off for uh, several years now, uh, but we've never met in person. So I'm very much looking forward to meeting him in person and uh, we'll have a little joint talk. So, hey, it, you know, it's Halloween, but if you happen to be in Atlanta uh, on that day, uh, you know, say, hey, swing by and check out our talk. And you know, if you happen to be a Dragon Challenge Coin owner, you know, I have a standing offer to buy you a drink upon presentation of said coin. And I'll return to that little tidbit after the news. All right, last article before the tip of the week. And this is another welcome story, uh, but unfortunately, it's probably just a drop in the uh, in the ocean. But hey, every little bit helps. And this is from Semaphore. The U.S. Justice Department and Microsoft said Thursday that they seized 107 internet domains used by hackers linked to Russian intelligence to target U.S. government employees, defense contractors, and civil society organizations. Federal investigators said hackers associated with an element of Russia's Federal Security Service, or FSB, used 41 domains in a spear phishing campaign targeting U.S.-based companies and current and former employees in the U.S. intelligence community, Pentagon, State Department, and Energy Department as well as U.S. defense contractors, according to court documents unsealed Thursday. Investigators believe the hackers were seeking to obtain, quote, information of value to the Russian government, especially in its efforts to engage in malign foreign influence operations within the United States, unquote. A federal court in Washington, D.C. also granted Microsoft permission to seize 66 Internet domains used by the same cyber espionage group called the Callisto Group or Star Blizzard. They all have weird names. To steal information from journalists, think tanks, and other civil society organizations, the company said. A lawyer for Microsoft's Digital Crimes Unit said in a blog post that the group has targeted at least 82 of its customers since January of last year, a rate of approximately one attack per week. The announcement comes about a month after the Justice Department announced the seizure of dozens of web domains linked to a Russian influence campaign aimed at U.S. voters ahead of the presidential election. And this is a quote from uh, Deputy Attorney General Lisa Monaco. Uh, who says, quote, the Russian government ran this scheme to steal Americans' sensitive information using seemingly legitimate email accounts to trick victims into revealing account credentials, unquote. And she also added the Justice Department will be relentless in exposing Russian actors and cyber criminals and depriving them of the tools of their illicit trade. So that's good. I'm glad to see that we're, you know, rolling up some of these uh, uh, hacker operations and influence operations. I'm sure there's a lot we haven't gotten, but there have been a lot of success stories, it seems, over the last couple of years. So uh, that that's a good thing. And I think that kind of segues nicely into this week's tip of the week. So I, of course, wrote a blog article on this and, and my newsletter. So if you're a newsletter subscriber, you've already gotten this article uh, waiting for you right now in your inbox. And otherwise, you can go to my website. It'll be the first article there at firewallsdon'tstopdragons.com. But I came across a couple of articles. I kind of did this in reverse. I came across a couple of interesting articles that came out almost at the exact same time. It, it seemed odd that, that it worked that way, but Tutanota and TechCrunch both put out very interesting articles about how to tell if your accounts have been hacked. And you might think, well, wouldn't you kind of know if your accounts have been hacked? Like maybe you've lost all the money in your bank account or uh, all of a sudden everybody you know, everybody in your contact list got a scam email or, or maybe you've suddenly lost access to your account. Well, yes, that, that certainly does happen. Uh, But sometimes, sometimes the bad guys lurk around a little bit first. Sometimes they're looking for information or sometimes the accounts they get into are really just a stepping stone into something bigger like identity theft or getting into a related account. For example, uh, this is something that I don't think a lot of people 
understand, but they think their email accounts are not that big a deal, right? I mean, what's in my email? Well, you know, I finally get newsletters. I send dumb emails between me and my friends. We send jokes out, you know, whatever. Maybe I send a shopping list to my husband that, you know, I don't care about my email. But what a lot of people forget about email accounts, uh, well, two things. First of all, is that gives access to all your contacts. So if I hack into your email account, I can, as you, email everybody you know, and it would be legitimately from you because it's coming from your account and try to scam them. Try to get them to say, you know, hey, I'm I'm stuck in a foreign country. I lost my wallet. I've been, I've been robbed. Please, you know, quickly send me some money to this address or whatever. There's a lot of scams you could use that for. Or, or hey, this is really cool. Check this out. And it's an infected file or a link that takes you to a malicious website. So there's that. But here's the kicker. And this is something I, I think a lot of people forget about. For all of our crazy security stuff we have in, you know, with uh, using password managers and passphrases and pass keys and two factor authentication, what it all basically comes down to is your email account. Because if you go to a website and you know someone's uh, login, you can say, hey, I forgot my password. And what's going to happen? They're going to send a password reset link to the email on file. So if you control that email account and you can get to some of these other accounts, you can reset all of those passwords because you control the email account. So with that in mind, bad guys might get into some of your accounts, your social media accounts, maybe your messaging accounts, maybe your email accounts to try to mine that for interesting data and perhaps some of these other kind of attacks that I'm talking about here, but they might not be immediately obvious. So how can you tell? How can you tell that somebody else has been in your account? Okay, so I'm going to give you a, a list of what we call indicators of compromise. These are things that you might look for that might indicate that someone has been in your account. So I want to want to stress, there are other things that can trigger some of these things too. And I'll maybe I'll try to mention some of those as we go. But for example, one of the things we're going to talk about here is, is when you go into your accounts, there's a place usually under the security settings where you can go and see past connections to your account, not just when, but from where. So for example, let's say some Russian hacker has gotten into your account, but it hasn't done anything overt with that yet. If you go and look at this list of activities, you'll see, yes, I accessed it from my home, I accessed this from work, I accessed this from the coffee shop, and and the, wait, wait, I accessed this from Moscow? <laughs> right? That is that is going to be a red flag. Also, a lot of these accounts, if especially if you have a connected app or if you've connected some of these accounts with other accounts, like for example, log in with Facebook or log in with Google, uh, or set up some other relationship with another account, uh, they will have a listing of some of those connections uh, so that you can review them and change them at any time. And if you notice that, okay, I've connected to this account from five devices, but only four of those are devices that I recognize, that could be a problem. Now, I say could be because, you know, maybe it's a spouse's device you forgot about. Maybe it's one of your old devices that you forgot about and you never disconnected. Some of these ones that where the location is weird, like, oh, that's weird. I, I live in North Carolina, but this is saying I connected from Virginia. I wasn't in Virginia. That's really weird. Okay, well, if you use a VPN, oftentimes VPN servers are not always located right where you are. They're usually connected to the fastest one they can find. Usually that's close to you, but sometimes those VPN servers might be a state or two away. So from the perspective of the service you're using, they will see you as coming from wherever the VPN server was. So again, my point is I'm going to read you some of these things and they might, you know, trigger some ideas, but make sure you realize that sometimes these things can be triggered for perfectly valid reasons as well. I don't like hyperbole. I don't like scaring people unnecessarily, but these are the kinds of things that might tip you off that someone has been into your account that shouldn't have been there. Okay. So let's, so let's start off our list. Unfamiliar logins in activity history. This is what I was just talking about. If you know where to look, and these articles I'm linking to will tell you how to do this for a lot of common accounts, you could see recent activity history on your account. And so that you would go and review those and make sure that they all make sense. And if something doesn't make sense, again, this is a potential sign that maybe someone else has gotten access to your account. Changes to your recovery information. So if you, most accounts have some, you know, recovery mechanism, some of them are like, you know, questions you can answer. Some of them are, you know, setting up a phone number or an email for a backup in case something goes wrong or you lose access to your primary email. So go look at that recovery information and see if there's anything new there. Is there a phone number you don't recognize? Is there a new email address you don't recognize? That could be a problem. That could be a bad guy who's gotten into your account and wants to ensure that they retain access to their account. So they've listed themselves or one of their contacts as a way to reset your password to things like that, a recovery option. Look at your email forwarding rules. 
some of us use these things religiously and, and, and have all sorts of uses for them. Other people don't even know they exist. But if a lot of email services, you can go in and set up certain forwarding rules. Like if I get something from this person, I'll automatically forward it to some other account or put it in this folder or things like that. Look for new email forwarding rules that you have not put in there. Sometimes attackers will do this to redirect incoming messages. Like let's say redirect any uh, email that says password reset in the subject and forward it to this whole different email account. So therefore you would never see that email and they would get it. Look for unexpected two-factor authentication requests. If you have 2FA set up and you're all of a sudden you're getting prompted, hey, here's your two-factor code or hey, go enter your two-factor code. And you're like, wait a minute, I'm not logging in. Why am I getting this? Well, it could be that the bad guys have gotten your password. They are trying to log in. And because you were smart enough and to, to put two-factor authentication on the account, they have been stopped by not having access to your two-factor authentication device. Now, bad guys have figured out ways to try to still fish that information from you. But if you're getting these out of nowhere, that could be a problem. Now, also, these two-factor authentication requests are often triggered when you're in a strange place or uh, something looks fishy. So, you know, maybe your device, you left it in the back of somebody's car or left it in the back of a taxi and it's trying to connect from some Starbucks that drove by. You know, I don't know that there are other weird things that might cause this to trigger. Look for new devices or sessions. This is kind of back to the activity thing. Look for devices you don't know uh, and sessions that don't make sense to you. Activity alerts. Some accounts uh, have automatic suspicious activity alerts. Uh, banks are one of them. You know, so if you're connected from a new device, if you've recently changed your password, if uh, you've connected from a new browser, a new location that wasn't normal, sometimes they will automatically send you an email. Uh, so if you're getting those out of nowhere, look at them carefully. Don't just disregard them and make sure that they make sense. Make sure that it was something that you did that triggered that and not potentially somebody else. Now, again, in some of these cases, uh, they don't necessarily mean that someone has compromised your account. Maybe it means they are trying to compromise your account. So you kind of need to think that through as well. You can also look for account setting changes, make sure someone didn't muck around with your privacy settings or notification settings. Like maybe you had notifications turned on for strange stuff and all of a sudden they got turned off. That would be weird. And that might indicate again that someone's trying to fly under the radar and not notify you that something bad's about to go down. For social media stuff, look for other weird anomalies. And this is really hard to judge because their algorithms are so opaque. But if all of a sudden you've apparently liked things that you know you didn't like, in other words, you've clicked the button that says like, or you've promoted something and you don't remember doing that, or all of a sudden your feed is full of a lot of stuff you didn't used to get, you know, maybe that means someone's been in your account, which triggered some new behavior or new <laughs> triggered their algorithm to start serving you different stuff. Maybe that's an indication. But again, these algorithms are so opaque, it's kind of hard to tell sometimes. Obviously, if you're getting emails for password resets or failed login attempts, that you should definitely pay attention to those. And then finally, maybe with email or posts, if something has been deleted, uh, you might have to go look in the trash or in the archive uh, and see if somebody posted something and immediately deleted it. That might be them trying to reach your audience and then, but not have you realize they're doing it. So they put it out there and then they delete it so you don't see it. So, so those are just some ideas. One other quick thing I will say about the activity thing. Keep in mind that your device uh, is on all the time. It's got Wi-Fi on. And let's say, let's say you always go to Panera on a certain day and you get, you get lunch or breakfast there and get coffee or something. And, you know, you're used to seeing yourself every Thursday morning. Okay, that's fine. But, you know, maybe it's one day on the way home, you decided to swing by and get yourself something at the drive through And you don't really think about that, but you get home and then you see, hey, that's weird. It says I was at Starbucks at this day and I never go on that day. Well, if you even drove by that place and slow down long enough that your device may have automatically connected to the Wi-Fi there because you've set it to automatically connect because you always go there, you know, then that might show up as a quote unquote session or activity on one of those devices like your social media, even though you really didn't stop there. Okay. So that, again, my point in all that is don't get freaked out if you see some of these things. Some of these things could have logical explanations that do not mean that somebody's in your account. But these are things you can look at, certainly in total, if you looked at a lot of these different things and checked, you know, more than one of these boxes. Uh, and obviously, some of these are pretty straightforward, like, you know, failed password attempts or password reset emails. You know, those are those are pretty serious. You need to take these things seriously. And these this could mean that somebody's in your accounts. So let's say, let's say you are now convinced that someone may be in your accounts, it is not you, it's not a spouse you've given your password to. Someone has potentially compromised your accounts. Now what? Well, okay, so the first thing you should definitely do, absolutely first thing, change your password. 
And you might think, oh God, now I got to remember a new password. Well, you shouldn't have to remember any of your passwords. I don't know any of my passwords because I use a password manager. So you really need to be using a password manager. But even if you don't have that set up, don't wait to set that up now. Just come up with a new password as quickly as you can and get it saved. Because remember, if a bad guy has access to your account, if they can log in as you, then they can do anything you can do, including resetting your password. So they could lock you out. So the first thing you want to do is lock them out. So <laughs> change your password right away. And if you haven't used a password manager yet, sometime in the very near future, do that, change it to a crazy random password and then update that again. But don't wait for that. Just get the password change done right away. Next, if you have used those exact same credentials, like the email address and that password, if you use those same ones on other sites, all those other sites are now vulnerable as well. And bad guys know that, and they will try to get into those accounts as well. So if you did reuse those credentials somewhere else, you also need to go and change all the credentials on all those sites as well and make every one of those stronger and unique. If you have not set up two-factor authentication, now would be a good time to do so. This is one of the reasons why we have two-factor authentication, so that if someone somehow manages to get your password, they still need your two-factor authentication device in order to access your account. It's defense in depth. It's belt and suspenders. So if you think someone's gotten your account, you should also check those other accounts that might be related and see if there's been uh, you know, unauthorized access or weird new connected apps or devices. Uh, again, the links in the article have really nice instructions on this. I'm not going to go through them here, but they've got pictures and step-by-step -step instructions for multiple email and social media and, and messaging accounts. Check those links from the article. They're really good. You might want to update your security questions and recovery information. If there's anything in there that somebody might be able to use to recover your account out from under you, then you should check that as well. Make sure they didn't add uh, an, an extra recovery device. Make sure if and you might want to go change your security questions uh, in any place you use those security questions, because if they could look at your account and see what the questions and answers are, it doesn't matter what you set your password to, they will be able to use those security questions to, to reset the password and get back into your account. Security questions are horrible, by the way. That is, that's a horrible way to, uh, to protect accounts, but a lot of them still use those. So you might want to go through and change your security questions. And by the way, I'll throw in one of my favorite tips for security questions, and that is to lie. <laughs> the answers to those questions do not need to be true. They only need to be answers that you can remember when challenged. So you could come up with some interesting ways to do that. That's not hard to remember. Like, you know, maybe the answer to, you know, what is your mother's maiden name? Maybe it's Smith. Well, maybe you say not Smith or Smith Smith or something like that. Come up with some response that you can remember that it's not really the answer. That is one way to do that. I know hardcore people that actually generate random nonsense as answers to security questions uh, and save those. And then you just have to remember to save those. You got to put that in a secure note somewhere for that account so that when you're asked again, you can give those crazy answers. But, you know, you could find something a little simpler than that. If somebody has gotten into your email account or messaging account or social media account and they have used it to send out spam or scams or something like that, then you obviously uh, you should probably, you know, put out a call and say, hey, my account was hacked. You know, be careful if you get something from this account. It's not really me. Uh, you, you should probably let them know to be suspicious. A lot of service providers, by the way, do have a mechanism for reporting things like this. I would go ahead and do that so that they know. And if you somehow did manage to get locked out of your own account, you're going to have to contact their support to try to get back in, and which could be really hard to do. But if nothing else, I would certainly let them know that this has happened or you think it might have happened so they can help be on the lookout and kind of get it on the record. And then after all of this, if it really did happen, if someone really did it in your account, then you just need to be extra careful. You know, who knows how they got in there in the first place. Even after all this, you're just going to need to be extra special care for a while. Keep a, an eye on the account. Go through these steps again, looking for unusual activity and kind of keep on this for a while until things settle down. So again, if you go to my article on firewallsdon'tstopdragons.com, the first one there uh, about indicators of account compromise, uh, toward the end of, the, of this article, uh, there's these two links to the Tuda Nota and the, or the Tuda and the TechCrunch articles on this with lots of great pictures and whatever. Uh, definitely want to check that out. That'll tell you how to do some of these things I just mentioned. And then also uh, within that article, there's also links to a lot other of my articles and, and other resources that, that you might find helpful. So again, it could be easy to be paranoid. I'm, I do not like making people unnecessarily freaked out over stuff. So go through the article, think about these things. Uh, and if you see something, then follow the instructions to uh, remedy the situation and you'll probably be okay. And even if you're not 100% sure, maybe this is a, 
a good time to use this opportunity to update your passwords, make them stronger, make them unique, get yourself into a password manager, turn on two-factor authentication. Before these things go bad, that is the best time to take these security measures is as a preventative measure, not as a recovery measure. So there you have it, everybody. There is your news and your tip of the week. All right, everybody, that's going to wrap it up for episode 397. Uh, 400 is on the horizon. Uh, just as a reminder to celebrate this and to try to get the word out and reach more people, uh, I'm asking my audience to post on their social media a link to one of their favorite podcast episodes. Uh, go back and find the one you really liked, post a link to it on your social media, add the hashtag FDSD400, which is Firewalls Don't Stop Dragons 400. And if possible, at mention me. I'm not on all social media. If you want to find out which ones I'm on and get my social media handles, uh, you can go to firewallsdon'tstopdragons.com and look for the contact page. It might be under a drop down menu, uh, and it'll have all my social media stuff there. And if you at mention me, I will certainly like it and probably repost it. And I haven't said too much about this, but as part of this awareness campaign, I am going to be <laughs> trying to identify people who have made the most impact people who have helped me reach the most new people. And this could be book readers, newsletter subscribers, podcast listeners, the people who helped me do this the most, I am going to be putting together a little Zoom party, uh, probably in January. This is gonna be going on for a few months where I will invite the folks that have had the most impact and we'll get together and do some Q and A. I'll probably give out a few choice prizes to the to the people who really made impacts, and we'll just hang out. So uh, that's a little bit of incentive, but I'm you know, kind of hoping you might want to do it anyway. But if you need some incentive, there's some incentive. Now, I told you I was going to talk a little bit about patron stuff. I don't talk about this too often. I probably should talk about it more. But I do have a Patreon subscription uh, where you can get access to some really cool perks. For example, uh, after every interview, I always get some bonus content from my patrons. So there's like an extra set of Q&A. Uh, with uh, everybody I interview, almost everybody, uh, everybody I interview. Uh, and then for higher level subscribers on the, on the news show weeks, I have a series that I call Merlin's Musings. And that's kind of whatever I want it to be, which is why I gave it that kind of a vague name. And I do everything from like personal history stuff to kind of behind the scenes stuff to other technical stuff. And like next week uh, with the Merlin's Musing that goes with this show. And these all come out on Thursdays. All the bonus podcast content for patrons come out on Thursdays. And uh, I'm going to start a series on how HTTPS works, like under the covers. This is something that your browser does all the time. <laughs> and we take it for granted. But there's some really interesting stuff going on there technically. And I'm also going to bring up some kind of interesting historical anecdotes uh, as we go through that as well. So anyway, I'll be starting that series next week. So if you go to fdsd.me slash support, one of the options there is uh, will take you to my Patreon account and you can get more information. There's a lot of other great uh, perks too. I've got a private Discord channel where you can chat with me uh, as well as with other patrons. Uh, and again, there I also kind of do some behind the scenes stuff and give you know my patrons a bit of more of a heads up on what's coming down the pike. I also ask for feedback a lot of times. So that would give you a chance to directly influence the kind of topics I cover and questions I ask the, the, the guests sometimes. Patrons also get a, a preview of the upcoming show. I usually put my shows together on Saturday for Monday. So uh, they will get a preview of what the show notes will be with all the links, usually on Saturday before the Monday show. And if you really want to get into this, I also have an InfoSec book club. We pick a new book every two months, and I try not to pick something super technical. I try to pick something that is, you know, interesting for everybody, but it's, you know, security or privacy related. So there, there's lots of great perks. Go to uh, fdsd.me slash support, and you will find the Patreon link, which will give you all the info you need. Check that out. But one, uh, but one more quick thing. So I started earlier this year what I called a coin and treasure chest promotion. Now, the coin part uh, is the Dragon Challenge coin, and it's really cool. Uh, if you go to my website and search on Dragon Challenge coin, you'll find pictures and even a little video of it. Uh, it's a really cool challenge coin. Uh, and I do promotions from time to time where I give those away, usually only in North America because shipping outside of that gets pretty salty. But I do do it from time to time. But the treasure chest part of that promotion, which I started earlier this year, is an ongoing promotion is for it'll go on as long as I've got coupon codes, because for people that sign up at uh, night errant level or higher, you actually kind of get subsidized to do that because I've got some promo codes from Malwarebytes, 
Proton and Safing for Portmaster that are like 40 or 50 bucks that kind of offset a lot of that uh, of that cost. So if you sign up for an annual membership at, at those levels, uh, and every time you re-up uh, annually, you could dip back into the treasure chest and get another promo code. So there's links to that in the show notes. But again, if you go to the website and search on Dragon Challenge Coin, you'll, you'll see that article where I talk about that promotion. All right, that's going to do it for this week. Uh, we've got great interviews coming up. I just recorded uh, like three awesome interviews in eight days. Bruce Schneier was one of them. Stacey Higginbotham, uh, the IoT guru, was another. And I just got done interviewing Carissa Belize, and she is the author of Privacy is Power, which is a fantastic book. And I have been trying to interview her literally since that book came out three and a half years ago. So that was a big deal for me. So all of those interviews will be dropping in the next couple months. All right, that'll do it for this week. Take care, everybody. Stay safe out there. And until next week, as always, don't get caught with your garbage day.